Leonardo da Vinci. 1. Development, 1452-1482 The most fascinating figure of the Renaissance was born on April 15, 1452, near the village of Vinci, some sixty miles from Florence. His mother was a peasant girl, Caterina, who had not bothered to marry his father. Her seducer, Piero d'Antonio, was a Florentine attorney of some means. In the year of Leonardo's birth, Piero married a woman of his own rank. Caterina had to be content with a peasant husband. She yielded her pretty love child to Piero and his wife. And Leonardo was brought up in semi-aristocratic comfort, without maternal love. Perhaps in that early environment he acquired his taste for fine clothing and his aversion to women. He went to a neighborhood school, took fondly to mathematics, music, and drawing, and delighted his father by his singing and his playing of the lute. In order to draw well, he studied all things in nature with curiosity, patience, and care. Science and art, so remarkably united in his mind, had there one origin, detailed observation. When he was turning fifteen, his father took him to Verrocchio's studio in Florence and persuaded that versatile artist to accept him as an apprentice. All the educated world knows Vasari's story of how Leonardo painted the angel at the left in Verrocchio's Baptism of Christ, and how the master was so overwhelmed by the beauty of the figure that he gave up painting and devoted himself to sculpture. Probably this abdication is a post-mortem legend. Verrocchio made several pictures after the baptism. Perhaps in these apprentice days, Leonardo painted the Annunciation in the Louvre with its awkward angel and its startled maid. He could hardly have learned grace from Verrocchio. Meanwhile, Ser Piero prospered, bought several properties, moved his family to Florence in 1469, and married four wives in turn. The second was only ten years older than Leonardo. When the third presented Piero with a child, Leonardo eased the congestion by going to live with Verrocchio. In that year, 1472, he was admitted to membership in the company of St. Luke. This guild, composed chiefly of apothecaries, physicians, and artists, had its headquarters in the hospital of Santa Maria Nuova. Presumably, Leonardo found there some opportunities to study internal as well as external anatomy. Perhaps in those years he, or was it he, painted the gaunt anatomical St. Jerome ascribed to him in the Vatican gallery, and it was probably he who, toward 1474, painted the colorful and immature Annunciation of the Uffizi. A week before his twenty-fourth birthday, Leonardo and three other youths were summoned before a committee of the Florentine Signory to answer a charge of having had homosexual relations. The result of this summons is unknown. On June 7, 1476, the accusation was repeated. The committee imprisoned Leonardo briefly, released him, and dismissed the charge as unproved. Unquestionably, he was a homosexual. As soon as he could afford to have his own studio, he gathered handsome young men about him. He took some of them with him on his migrations from city to city. He referred to one or another of them in his manuscripts as Amantissimo or Carissimo, most beloved, dearest. What his intimate relations with these youths were we do not know. Some passages in his notes suggest a distaste for sexual congress in any form. Leonardo might reasonably doubt why he and a few others had been singled out for public accusation when homosexuality was so widespread in the Italy of the time. He never forgave Florence for the indignity of his arrest. Apparently he took the matter more seriously than the city did. A year after the accusation he was invited and agreed to accept a studio in the Medici Gardens, and in 1478 the Signory itself asked him to paint an altarpiece for the chapel of St. Bernard in the Palazzo Vecchio. For some reason he did not carry out the assignment. Ghirlandaio took it over. Filippino Lippi completed it. Nevertheless, the Signory soon gave him and Botticelli another commission, to paint, we cannot say to the life, full-length portraits of two men hanged for the conspiracy of the Pazzi against Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici. Leonardo, with his half-morbid interest in human deformity and suffering, may have felt some fascination in the gruesome task. But indeed he was interested in everything. All postures and actions of the human body, all expressions of the face in young and old, all the organs and movements of animals and plants, from the waving of wheat in the field to the flight of birds in the air, 
all the cyclical erosion and elevation of mountains, all the currents and eddies of water and wind, the moods of the weather, the shades of the atmosphere, and the inexhaustible kaleidoscope of the sky. All these seemed endlessly wonderful to him. Repetition never dulled for him their marvel and mystery. He filled thousands of pages with observations concerning them and drawings of their myriad forms. When the monks of San Scopeto asked him to paint a picture for their chapel in 1481, he made so many sketches for so many features and forms of it that he lost himself in the details and never finished the adoration of the Magi. Nevertheless, it is one of his greatest paintings. The plan from which he developed it was drawn on a strictly geometrical pattern of perspective, with the whole space divided into diminishing squares. The mathematician in Leonardo always competed, often cooperated, with the artist. But the artist was already developed. The Virgin had the pose and features that she would keep in Leonardo's work to the end. The Magi were drawn with a remarkable understanding, for a youth, of character and expression in old men and the philosopher at the left was literally a brown study of half-skeptical meditation, as if the painter had so soon come to view the Christian story with a spirit unwillingly incredulous and still devout. And around these figures half a hundred others gathered, as if every kind of man and woman had hurried to this crib seeking hungrily the meaning of life and some light of the world, and finding the answer in a stream of births. The unfinished masterpiece, almost erased by time, hangs in the Uffizi at Florence, but it was Filippino Lippi who executed the painting accepted by the Scopettini Brotherhood. To begin, to conceive too richly, to lose himself in experimenting with details, to see beyond his subject a boundless perspective of human, animal, plant, and architectural forms, of rocks and mountains, streams and clouds and trees, in a mystic chiaroscuro light, to be absorbed in the philosophy of the picture rather than in its technical accomplishment, to leave to others the lesser task of coloring the figures so drawn and placed for revealing significance, to turn in despair after long labor of mind and body from the imperfection with which the hand and the materials had embodied the dream. This was to be Leonardo's character and fate, with a few exceptions, to the end. 2. In Milan, 1482-1499 there was nothing hesitant, no sense yet of the merciless brevity of time, only youth's limitless ambitions fed by burgeoning powers, in the letter that Leonardo, now thirty, sent in 1482 to Lodovico, regent of Milan. He had had enough of Florence, the desire to see new places and faces mounted in his blood. He had heard that Lodovico wanted a military engineer, an architect, a sculptor, a painter. Well, he would offer himself as all these in one and so he wrote his famous letter. Most illustrious Lord, having now sufficiently seen and considered the proofs of all those who count themselves masters and inventors of instruments of war, and finding that their invention and use of the said instruments does not differ in any respect from those in common practice, I am emboldened without prejudice to anyone else to put myself in communication with Your Excellency in order to acquaint you with my secrets, thereafter offering myself at your pleasure effectually to demonstrate at any convenient time all those matters which are in part briefly recorded below. 1. I have plans for bridges, very light and strong and suitable for carrying very easily. 2. When a place is besieged, I know how to cut off water from the trenches and how to construct an infinite number of scaling ladders and other instruments. 4. I have plans for making cannon, very convenient and easy of transport, with which to hurl small stones in the manner almost of hail. 5. And if it should happen that the engagement is at sea, I have plans for constructing many engines most suitable for attack or defense, and ships which can resist the fire of all the heaviest cannon, and powder and smoke. 6. Also I have ways of arriving at a certain fixed spot by caverns and secret winding passages made without any noise, even though it may be necessary to pass underneath trenches or a river. 7. Also I can make covered cars, safe and unassailable, which will enter the serried ranks of the enemy with artillery, and there is no company of men-at-arms so great as not to be broken by it. And behind these the infantry will be able to follow quite unharmed and without any opposition. 8. Also, if need shall arise, I can make cannon, mortars, and light ordnance, of very beautiful and useful shapes, quite different from those in common use. 9. 
where it is not possible to employ cannon, I can supply catapults, mangonels, traps, and other engines of wonderful efficacy not in general use. In short, as the variety of circumstances shall necessitate, I can supply an infinite number of different engines of attack and defense. 10. In time of peace I believe that I can give you as complete satisfaction as anyone else, in architecture, in the construction of buildings both public and private, and in conducting water from one place to another. Also I can execute sculpture in bronze, marble, or clay, and also painting, in which my work will stand comparison with that of anyone else, whoever he may be. Moreover, I would undertake the work of the bronze horse, which shall endue with immortal glory and eternal honor the auspicious memory of the prince your father, and of the illustrious house of Sforza. And if any of the aforesaid things should seem impossible or impracticable to any one, I offer myself as ready to make trial of them in your park or in whatever place shall please your excellency, to whom I commend myself with all possible humility. We do not know how Lodovico replied, but we know that Leonardo reached Milan in 1482 or 1483, and soon made his way into the heart of the Moor. One story has it that Lorenzo, as a diplomatic bonbon, had sent him to Lodovico to deliver a handsome lute, another that he won a musical contest there, and was retained not for any of the powers that he had claimed with all possible humility, but for the music of his voice, the charm of his conversation, the soft, sweet tone of the lyre that his own hands had fashioned in the form of a horse's head. Lodovico seems to have accepted him not at his own valuation, but as a brilliant youth who, even though he might be less of an architect than Bramante, and too inexperienced to be entrusted with military engineering, might plan court masks and city pageants, decorate dresses for wife or mistress or princess, paint murals and portraits, and perhaps construct canals to improve the irrigation of the Lombard plain. It offends us to learn that the myriad-minded man had to spend irrecoverable time making curious girdles for Lodovico's pretty bride, Beatrice d'Este, conceiving costumes for jousts and festivals, organizing pageants or decorating stables. But a Renaissance artist was expected to do all these things between Madonnas. Bramante, too, shared in this courtlery. And who knows but the woman in Leonardo delighted in designing dresses and jewelry, and the accomplished equestrian in him enjoyed painting swift horses on stable walls. He adorned the ballroom of the Castello for the marriage of Beatrice, built a special bathroom for her, raised in the garden a pretty pavilion for her summer joy, and painted other rooms, Camerini, for palace celebrations. He made portraits of Lodovico, Beatrice, and their children, of Lodovico's mistresses Cecilia Gallerani and Lucrezia Crivelli. These paintings are lost, unless La Belle Ferronniere of the Louvre is Lucrezia. Vasari speaks of the family portraits as marvelous, and the picture of Lucrezia inspired a poet to a fervid eulogy of the lady's beauty and the artist's skill. Perhaps Cecilia was Leonardo's model for the Virgin of the Rocks. The painting was contracted for in 1483 by the confraternity of the Conception as the central part of an altarpiece for the Church of San Francesco. The original was later bought by Francis I and is in the Louvre. Standing before it, we note the softly maternal face that Leonardo would use a dozen times in later works. An angel recalling one in Verrocchio's Baptism of Christ, two infants exquisitely drawn, and a background of jutting, overhanging rocks that only Leonardo could have conceived as Mary's habitat. The colors have been darkened by time, but possibly the artist intended a darkling effect and suffused his pictures with a hazy atmosphere that Italy calls sfumato, smoked. This is one of Leonardo's greatest pictures, surpassed only by The Last Supper, Mona Lisa, and The Virgin Child in St. Anne. The Last Supper and Mona Lisa are the world's most famous paintings. Hour after hour, day after day, year after year, pilgrims enter the refectory that holds Leonardo's most ambitious work. In that simple rectangular building, the Dominican friars who were attached to Lodovico's favorite church, Santa Maria delle Grazie, took their meals. Soon after the artist arrived in Milan, Lodovico asked him to represent the Last Supper on the farthest wall of this refectory. For three years, from 1495 to 1498, on and off, Leonardo labored or dallied at the task, while Duke and Friars fretted over his incalculable delays. The Prior, if we may believe Vasari, complained to Lodovico of Leonardo's apparent sloth, 
and wondered why he would sometimes sit before the wall for hours without painting a stroke. Leonardo had no trouble explaining to the duke, who had some trouble explaining to the prior, that an artist's most important work lies in conception rather than in execution, and, as Vasari put it, men of genius do most when they work least. There were in this case, said Leonardo to Lodovico, two special difficulties. To conceive features worthy of the Son of God, and to picture a man as heartless as Judas. Perhaps, he slyly suggested, he might use the too frequently seen face of the prior as a model for Iscariot. Leonardo hunted throughout Milan for heads and faces that might serve him in representing the apostles. From a hundred such quarries, he chose the features that were melted in the mintage of his art into those astonishingly individualized heads that make the wonder of the dying masterpiece. Sometimes he would rush from the streets or his studio to the refectory, add a stroke or two to the picture, and depart. The subject was superb, but from a painter's point of view it was pitted with hazards. It had to confine itself to male figures and a modest table in a simple room. There could be only the dimmest landscape or vista. No grace of women might serve as foil to the strength of the men. No vivid action could be brought in to set the figures into motion and convey the sense of life. Leonardo let in a glimpse of landscape through the three windows behind Christ. As a substitute for action, he portrayed the gathering at the tense moment Christ has prophesied that one of the apostles will betray him and each is asking, in fear or horror or amazement, Is it I? The institution of the Eucharist might have been chosen, but that would have frozen all thirteen faces into an immobile and stereotyped solemnity. Here, on the contrary, there is more than violent physical action. There is a searching and revelation of spirit. Never again, so profoundly, has an artist revealed in one picture so many souls. For the apostles, Leonardo made numberless preliminary sketches. Some of these, for James the Greater, Philip, Judas, are drawings of such finesse and power as only Rembrandt and Michelangelo have matched. When he tried to conceive the features of Christ, Leonardo found that the apostles had exhausted his inspiration. According to Lomazzo, writing in 1557, Leonardo's old friend Zenale advised him to leave the face of Christ unfinished, saying, of a truth it would be impossible to imagine faces lovelier or gentler than those of James the Greater or James the Less. Accept your misfortune, then, and leave your Christ incomplete. For otherwise, when compared with the apostles, he would not be their Savior or their Master. Leonardo took the advice. He or a pupil made a famous sketch, now in the Brera Gallery, for the head of Christ, but it pictured an effeminate sadness and resignation rather than the heroic resolve that calmly entered Gethsemane. Perhaps Leonardo lacked the reverent piety that, had it been added to his sensitivity, his depth, and his skill, might have brought the picture nearer to perfection. Because he was a thinker as well as an artist, Leonardo shunned fresco painting as an enemy to thought. Such painting on wet and freshly laid plaster had to be done rapidly before the plaster dried. Leonardo preferred to paint on a dry wall with tempera, colors mixed in a gelatinous substance, for this method allowed him to ponder and experiment. But these colors did not adhere firmly to the surface, and even in Leonardo's lifetime, what with the usual dampness of the refectory and its occasional flooding and heavy rains, the paint began to flake and fall. When Vasari saw the picture in 1536, it was already blurred. When Lomazzo saw it, sixty years after its completion, it was already ruined beyond repair. The friars later helped decay by cutting a door through the legs of the apostles into the kitchen, this in 1656. The engraving by which the painting has been reproduced throughout the world was taken not from the spoiled original, but from an imperfect copy made by one of Leonardo's pupils, Marco Dogiono. Today we can study only the composition and the general outlines, hardly the shades or subtleties. But whatever were the defects of the work when Leonardo left it, some realized at once that it was the greatest painting that Renaissance art had yet produced. Meanwhile, in 1483, Leonardo had undertaken a work completely different and still more difficult. Lodovico had long wished to commemorate his father, Francesco Sforza, with an equestrian statue that would bear comparison with Donatello's Gatemalata at Padua and Verrocchio's Colleoni in Venice. Leonardo's ambition was stirred. 
He set himself to studying the anatomy, action, and nature of the horse, and soon drew a hundred sketches of the animal, nearly all of snorting vivacity. Soon he was absorbed in making a plaster model. When some citizens of Piacenza asked him to recommend an artist to design and cast bronze doors for their cathedral, he wrote characteristically in reply, There is no one who is capable except Leonardo the Florentine, who is making the bronze horse of the Duke Francesco, and you need take no count of him, for he has work that will last his whole lifetime and I fear that it is so great an undertaking that he will never finish it. Lodovico at times thought so too, and asked Lorenzo for other artists to come and complete the task in 1489. Lorenzo, like Leonardo, could not think of anybody better than Leonardo himself. At last, in 1493, the plaster model was finished. All that remained was to cast it in bronze. In November, the model was set up publicly under an arch to adorn the wedding procession of Lodovico's niece, Bianca Maria. Men marveled at its size and splendor. Horse and rider rose to twenty-six feet. Poets wrote sonnets in its praise, and no one doubted that when cast it would surpass in power and life the masterpieces of Donatello and Verrocchio. But it was never cast. Apparently, Lodovico could not spare funds for the fifty tons of bronze required. The model was left in the open, while Leonardo busied himself with art and boys, with science and experiments, with mechanisms and manuscripts. When the French captured Milan in 1499, their bowmen made a target of the plaster cavallo and broke off many pieces of it. Louis XII, in 1501, expressed a desire to cart it off to France as a trophy. We do not hear of it again. The great fiasco unnerved and exhausted Leonardo for a time and may have disturbed his relations with the duke. Normally, Lodovico paid his appelles well. A cardinal was surprised to learn that Leonardo received 2,000 ducats, or $25,000, a year, in addition to many gifts and privileges. The artist lived like an aristocrat. He had several apprentices, servants, pages, horses, engaged musicians, dressed in silks and furs, embroidered gloves and fancy leather boots. Although he produced works beyond price, he seemed at times to dally with his assignments, or to interrupt them for his private researches and compositions in science, philosophy, and art. In 1497, tired of such delays, Lodovico invited Perugino to come and decorate some rooms in the Castello. Perugino could not come, and Leonardo took over the assignment, but the incident left hurt feelings on both sides. About this time, Lodovico, straightened in his finances by diplomatic and military expenses, fell behind in paying Leonardo's salary. Leonardo paid his own costs for almost two years and then sent the Duke a gentle reminder in 1498. Lodovico excused himself graciously and a year later gave Leonardo a vineyard as a source of revenue. By that time, Lodovico's political edifice was falling about him. The French captured Milan, Lodovico fled, and Leonardo found himself uncomfortably free. He moved to Mantua in December of 1499 and there made a remarkable drawing of Isabella d'Este. She let her husband give it away as the first stage of its journey to the Louvre, and Leonardo, not relishing such generosity, passed on to Venice. He marveled at its proud beauty, but found its rich colors and Gothic Byzantine ornaments too bright for his Florentine taste. He turned his steps back to the city of his youth. 3. Florence, 1500-1501 and 1503-1506 he was forty-eight when he tried to take up again the cords of life that he had snapped some seventeen years before. He had changed. Florence had too, but divergently. She had become in his absence a half-democratic, half-Puritan republic. He was accustomed to ducal rule and to soft aristocratic luxuries and ways. Florentines, always critical, looked askance at his silks and velvets, his gracious manners, and his retinue of curly-headed youth. Michelangelo, twenty-two years his junior, resented the good looks that so contrasted with his own broken nose, and wondered in his poverty where Leonardo found the funds to maintain so rich a life. Leonardo had salvaged some six hundred ducats from his Milan days. Now he refused many commissions, even from the imperious Marchesa of Mantua, and when he worked it was with his wanted leisureliness. The Servite friars had engaged Filippino Lippi to paint an altarpiece for their Church of the Annunziata. Leonardo casually expressed his desire to do a similar work. 
Filippino courteously surrendered the assignment to the man then generally considered to be the greatest painter in Europe. The Servites brought Leonardo and his household to live at the monastery and paid their expenses for what seemed a very long time. Then one day in 1501, he unveiled the cartoon for his proposed picture of the Virgin and Child with St. Anne and the infant St. John. It not only filled every artist with wonder, says Vasari, but when it was set up, men and women, young and old, flocked for two days to see it, as if in festival time, and they marveled exceedingly. We do not know if this was the full-size drawing that is now a treasured possession of the Royal Academy of Arts in Burlington House, London. Probably it was, though French authorities like to believe that it was the first form of the quite different picture in the Louvre. The smile of tender pride that softens and brightens the face of the Virgin in the cartoon is one of Leonardo's miracles. Beside it, the smile of Mona Lisa is earthly and cynical. Nevertheless, though this is among the greatest of Renaissance drawings, it is unsuccessful. There is something ungainly and in poor taste in seating the Virgin unstably across the widespread legs of her mother. Leonardo apparently neglected to transform this sketch into a picture for the Servites, they had to turn back to Lippi and then to Perugino for their altarpiece. But soon afterward, perhaps from a variant of the Burlington cartoon, Leonardo painted the Virgin St. Anne and the Infant Jesus of the Louvre. This is a technical triumph, from Anne's diademed head to Mary's feet, scandalously naked but divinely fair. The triangular composition that had failed in the cartoon here came to full success. The four heads of Anne, Mary the child, and the lamb make one rich line. The child and his grandmother are intent on Mary, and the incomparable draperies of the women fill out the divergent space. The characteristic sfumato of Leonardo's brush has softened all outlines, as shadows soften them in life. The Leonardesque smile, on Mary in the cartoon, but on Anne in the painting, set a fashion that would continue in Leonardo's followers for half a century. From the mystic ecstasy of these tender evocations, Leonardo passed, by an almost incredible transition, to serve Caesar Borgia as military engineer. This June 1502. Borgia was beginning his third campaign in the Romagna. He wanted a man who could make topographical maps, build and equip fortresses, bridge or divert streams, and invent weapons of offense and defense. Perhaps he had heard of the ideas that Leonardo had expressed or drawn for new engines of war. There was, for example, his sketch for an armored car or tank whose wheels were to be moved by soldiers within its walls. These cars, Leonardo had written, take the place of elephants. One may tilt with them. One may hold bellows in them to terrify the horses of the enemy. One may put carabineers in them to break up every company. Or, said Leonardo, you can put terrible scythes on the flanks of a chariot and a still more lethal revolving scythe on a forward projecting shaft. These would mow down men like a field of grain. Or you can make the wheels of the chariot turn a mechanism that will swing deadly flails at four ends. You can attack a fort by placing your soldiers under some protective covering, and you can repel besiegers by throwing down upon them bottles of poison gas. Leonardo had planned a book of how to drive back armies by the fury of floods caused by releasing waters, and a book of how to inundate armies by closing the outlets of waters flowing through valleys. He had designed devices for mechanically discharging a succession of arrows from a revolving platform, for raising cannon upon a carriage, for toppling over the crowded ladders of a besieging force attempting to scale the walls. Borgia put most of these contraptions aside as impracticable. He tried one or two in the Siege of Cherry in 1503. Nevertheless, he issued the following patent of authority in August 1502. To all our lieutenants, castellans, captains, condottieri, officials, soldiers, and subjects, we constrain and command that the bearer, our most excellent and well-beloved servant, architect, and engineer-in-chief, Leonardo Vinci, whom we have appointed to inspect strongholds and fortresses in our dominions to the end that according to their need and his counsel we may be enabled to provide for their necessities, to accord a passage absolutely free from any toll or tax, a friendly welcome both for himself and his company, freedom to see, examine, and take measurements precisely as he may wish, and for this purpose assistance in men as many as he may desire, and all possible aid and favor. It is our will that in the execution of any works in our dominions every engineer will be bound to confer with him and follow his advice. 
Leonardo wrote much, but rarely about himself. We should have relished his opinion of Borgia, and might have put it illuminatingly beside that of the envoy whom Florence was sending to Caesar at this time, Niccolo Machiavelli. But all that we know is that Leonardo visited Imola, Faenza, Forli, Ravenna, Rimini, Pesaro, Urbino, Perugia, Siena, and other cities, that he was in Senegalia when Caesar snared and strangled there four treasonable captains, and that he presented Caesar with six extensive maps of central Italy, showing the direction of the streams, the nature and contours of the terrain, the distances between rivers, mountains, fortresses, and towns. Then suddenly he learned that Caesar was almost dead in Rome, the Caesarian Empire was collapsing, and an enemy of the Borgias was mounting the papal throne. Once more, Leonardo, his new world of action fading before him, turned back to Florence in April 1503. In October of that year, Pietro Soderini, head of the Florentine government, proposed to Leonardo and Michelangelo that each should paint a mural in the new Hall of the Five Hundred in the Palazzo Vecchio. Both men accepted, strict contracts were drawn up, and the artists retired to separate studios to design their guiding cartoons. Each was to picture some triumph of Florentine arms. Angelo, an action in the war with Pisa, Leonardo, the victory of Florence over Milan at Anghiari. The alert citizens followed the progress of the work as a contest of gladiators. Argument rose excitedly on the rival merits and styles, and some observers thought that any definite superiority of one picture over the other would decide whether later painters would follow Leonardo's bent toward delicate and subtle representation of feeling, or Michelangelo's penchant for mighty muscles and demonic force. Perhaps it was at this time, for the incident has no date, that the younger artist let his dislike of Leonardo come to flagrant insult. One day some Florentines in the Piazza Santa Trinita were discussing a passage in the Divine Comedy. Seeing Leonardo pass, they stopped him and asked for his interpretation. At that moment Michelangelo appeared, who was known to have studied Dante zealously. Here is Michelangelo, said Leonardo. He will explain the verses. Thinking that Leonardo was making fun of him, the unhappy Titan broke out in violent scorn, Explain them yourself, you who made the model of a horse to be cast in bronze and could not cast it and left it unfinished to your shame. And these Milanese capons thought you could do it. Leonardo, we are told, flushed deeply but made no reply. Michelangelo marched off fuming. Leonardo prepared his cartoon carefully. He visited the scene of the engagement at Don Ghiari, read reports of it, made innumerable sketches of horses and men in the passion of battle or the agony of death. Now, as seldom in Milan, he found an opportunity to put movement into his art. He took full advantage of it, and depicted such a fury of mortal conflict that Florence almost shuddered at the sight. No one had supposed that this most refined of Florentine artists could conceive or picture such a vision of patriotic homicide. Perhaps Leonardo used here his experience in Caesar Borgia's campaign. The horrors that he may then have witnessed could be expressed in his drawing and exercised from his mind. By February of 1505 he had finished his cartoon and began to paint its central picture, the Battle of the Standard, in the Sala dei Cinquecento. But now again he who had studied physics and chemistry and had not yet learned the fate of his Last Supper made a tragic mistake. Experimenting with encaustic techniques, he thought to fix the colors into the stucco wall by heat from a brazier on the floor. The room was damp, the winter was cold, the heat did not reach high enough, the stucco failed to absorb the paint, the upper colors began to run, and no frenzied effort availed to halt the ruin. Meanwhile, financial difficulties arose. The signory was paying Leonardo 15 florins, or about $188 per month, hardly to be compared with the 160 or so that Lodovico had assigned him in Milan. When a tactless official offered the month's payment in coppers, Leonardo rejected them. He abandoned the enterprise in shame and despair, only moderately consoled by the fact that Michelangelo, after completing his cartoon, made no painting from it at all, but accepted a call from Pope Julius II to come and work in Rome. The great competition was a sorry mess that left Florence ill-disposed toward the two greatest artists in her history. On and off, during the years 1503 to 1506, Leonardo painted the portrait of Mona Lisa, that is, Madonna Elisabetta, third wife of Francesco del Giocondo, who in 1512 was to be a member of the Signory. 
Presumably a child of Francesco, buried in 1499, was one of Elisabetta's children, and this loss may have helped to mold the serious features behind La Gioconda's smile. That Leonardo should call her back to his studio so many times during those three years, that he should spend upon her portrait all the secrets and nuances of his art, modeling her softly with light and shade, framing her in a fanciful vista of trees and waters, mountains and sky, clothing her in raiment of velvet and satin woven into folds whose every wrinkle is a masterpiece, studying with passionate care the subtle muscles that form and move the mouth, bringing musicians to play for her and to evoke upon her features the disillusioned tenderness of a mother remembering a departed child. These are inklings of the spirit in which he came to this engaging merger of painting and philosophy. A thousand interruptions, a hundred distracting interests, the simultaneous struggle with the Anghiari design left unbroken the unity of his conception, the unwanted pertinacity of his zeal. This, then, is the face that launched a thousand reams upon a sea of ink. Not an unusually lovely face, a shorter nose would have launched more reams, and many a lass in oil or marble, as in any Correggio, would by comparison make Lisa only moderately fair. It is her smile that has made her fortune through the centuries, a nascent twinkle in her eyes, an amused and checked upcurving of her lips. What is she smiling at? The efforts of the musicians to entertain her? The leisurely diligence of an artist who paints her through a thousand days and never makes an end? Or is it not just Mona Lisa smiling, but woman, all woman, saying to all men, poor impassioned lovers, a nature blindly commanding continuance, burns your nerves with an absurd hunger for our flesh, softens your brains with a quite unreasonable idealization of our charms, lifts you to lyrics that subside with consummation, and all that you may be precipitated into parentage. Could anything be more ridiculous? But we too are snared. We women pay a heavier price than you for your infatuation. And yet, sweet fools, it is pleasant to be desired, and life is redeemed when we are loved. Or was it only the smile of Leonardo himself that Lisa wore, of the inverted spirit that could hardly recall the tender touch of a woman's hand, and could believe in no other destiny for love or genius than obscene decomposition and a little fame flickering out in man's forgetfulness? When at last the sittings ended, Leonardo kept the picture, claiming that this most finished of all portraits was still incomplete. Perhaps the husband did not like the prospect of having his wife curl up her lips at him and his guests, hour after hour from his walls. Many years later, Francis I bought it for four thousand crowns, or fifty thousand dollars, and framed it in his palace at Fontainebleau. Today, after time and restorations have blurred its subtleties, it hangs in the majestic Salon Carré of the Louvre, daily amused by a thousand worshippers, and waiting for time to efface and confirm Mona Lisa's smile. 4. In Milan and Rome 1506 to 1516. Contemplating such a picture and reckoning how many hours of thought must have guided so many minutes of the brush, we revise our judgment of Leonardo's seeming sloth and perceive again that his work embodied the meditations of numberless inactive days, as when an author on an evening's stroll or lying sleepless in the night molds the next day's chapter, page, or verse or rolls on the mind's tongue some savory adjective or bewitching phrase. And in those same five years at Florence that saw the virgin child and Saint Anne in all its forms, and Mona Lisa, and the ferocious cartoon and melting battle, Leonardo found time to paint other pictures, like the lovely portrait of Ginevra de Benci, now in Vienna, and the lost youthful Christ that at last he yielded to the importunate Marchioness of Mantua in 1504 but her agent sent her a revealing note. Leonardo grows very impatient of painting and spends most of his time on geometry. Perhaps in those outwardly idle hours, Leonardo was burying the artist in the scientist, the Apelles in the Faust. However, science brought no fees, and though he was living simply now, he must have mourned the passing of those days when he had been the artist prince of Milan. When Charles d'Amboise, Viceroy of Milan for Louis the Twelfth invited him to return, Leonardo asked Soderini might he be excused for a few months from his commitments to Florence. Soderini complained that Leonardo had not yet earned the money paid him for the Battle of Anghiari. Leonardo raised the unearned sum and brought it to Soderini, who refused it. 
Finally, in 1506, Soderini, anxious to keep the goodwill of the French king, let Leonardo go on condition that he returned to Florence after three months or pay a penalty of 150 ducats. He went, and though he revisited Florence in 1507, 1509, and 1511, he remained in the employ of Amboise and Louis in Milan till 1513. Soderini protested, but Louis overruled him with the gracious courtesy of confident strength. To make matters quite clear, Louis in 1507 appointed Leonardo peintre et ingénieur ordinaire, painter and engineer in ordinary, to the king of France. It was no sinecure. Leonardo earned his keep. We hear of him again decorating palaces, designing or building canals, preparing pageants, painting pictures, planning an equestrian monument of Marshal Trivuzio, and collaborating in anatomical studies with Marc Antonio della Torre. Probably during this second stay at Milan, he painted two pictures that came from the lower levels of his genius. The St. John of the Louvre has the rounded contours of a woman and such flowing curls and delicate features as might have graced a Magdalen. Lida and the Swan, in a private collection in Rome, has a face and fleshly softness recalling the St. John and the Bacchus formerly ascribed to Leonardo, but it is most likely a copy from a lost painting or a cartoon by the master. His fame would have gained had these pictures died at birth. In 1512, the French were chased out of Milan, and Lodovico's son Maximilian began a brief reign. Leonardo stayed a while, writing illegible notes on science and art while Milan burned with fires set by the Swiss. But in 1513, hearing that Leo X had been chosen pope, he thought there might be in Medici and Rome a place even for an artist of 61 years, and he set out with four of his pupils. At Florence, Leo's brother, Giuliano de' Medici, attached Leonardo to his retinue and assigned him a monthly stipend of 33 ducats, or about $412. Arrived in Rome, Leonardo was welcomed by the art-loving Pope, who gave him rooms in the Belvedere Palace. Presumably, Leonardo met, certainly he influenced, Raphael and Sodoma. Leo may have given him a commission for a picture, for Vasari tells how surprised the Pope was to find Leonardo mixing varnish before doing any painting. This man, Leo is reported to have said, will never do anything, for he begins to think of the last stage before the first. In truth, Leonardo had now ceased to be a painter. Science more and more absorbed him. He studied anatomy at the hospital, worked on problems of light, and wrote many pages on geometry. He amused his leisure by constructing a mechanical lizard with beard, horns, and wings, which he made to flutter by an injection of quicksilver. Leo lost interest in him. But meanwhile, Francis I, a royal lover of art, had succeeded Louis XII. In October 1515, he recaptured Milan. Apparently, he invited Leonardo to join him there. Early in 1516, Leonardo bade farewell to Italy and accompanied Francis to France. 5. The Man What sort of man was this prince of art? There are several alleged portraits of him, but none before fifty. Vasari speaks with unusual fervor of the never adequately praised beauty of his body and the splendor of his appearance, which was extremely beautiful and made every sorrowful soul serene. But Vasari spoke from hearsay, and we have no representation of this godlike stage. Even in middle age, Leonardo wore a long beard, carefully perfumed and curled. A portrait of Leonardo by himself, in the Royal Library at Windsor, shows a broad and benign face with long flowing hair and a vast white beard. A magnificent painting in the Uffizi Gallery by an unknown artist pictures him with a strong face, searching eyes, white hair and beard, and soft black hat. The noble figure of Plato in Raphael's School of Athens from 1509 has by tradition and some scholars been called a portrait of Leonardo. A self-portrait in chalk in the Turin Gallery shows him bald to the mid-pate, wrinkled in forehead, cheeks and nose, and almost lost in hair. He seems to have grown old before his time and died at sixty-seven, despite a careful vegetarian regimen, while Michelangelo, who scorned hygiene and entertained one ailment after another, reached eighty-nine. He dressed in luxurious clothing while Michelangelo lived in his boots. Yet Leonardo in his prime was known for his strength, bending a horseshoe with his hands. He was an expert fencer and skilled in riding and managing horses, which he loved as the noblest and fairest of animals. Apparently he drew, painted, and wrote with his left hand, 
This, rather than a desire to be illegible, made him write from right to left. We have suggested that his homosexuality was not innate, but grew out of the unpleasant relation of a burdened stepmother with a bastard stepson. His need for receiving and returning affection found satisfaction with the handsome youths whom he later collected. He drew women much less frequently than men. He acknowledged their beauty, but seems to have shared Socrates' preference for boys. In all the jungle of his manuscripts there is no word of love or tenderness for women. Yet he understood well many phases of woman's nature. No one has surpassed him in representing virginal delicacy, motherly solicitude, or feminine subtlety. It may be that his sensitiveness, his secretive anagrams and codes, his double locking of his studio at night, had a root in his consciousness of abnormality as well as in his fear of being charged with heresy. He was not anxious to be read by the many. The truth of things, he wrote, is a supreme food for fine intelligences, but not for wandering wits. His sexual inversion may have influenced other elements of his character. He was the soul of gentle kindness to his friends. He protested against killing animals, would not allow anyone to hurt any living thing. He bought caged birds to free them. In other aspects, he seemed morally insensitive. He was apparently fascinated by the problem of designing instruments of war. He appears to have felt no strong resentment against the French for condemning to a dungeon the Lodovico who for sixteen years had maintained him handsomely in Milan. He went off without visible qualms to serve a Borgia whom Florence feared as a threat to her liberty. Like every artist, every author, and every homosexual, he was unusually self-conscious, sensitive, and vain. Say to Sarai, solo to Sarai tuto tuo, he wrote. If you are alone, you are all your own. With a companion you are half yourself, so you squander yourself according to the indiscretion of your company. He could shine in company as a musician or a conversationalist, but he liked rather to isolate himself in rapt concentration on his tasks. The chief gift of nature, he said, never having starved, is liberty. His virtues were the better side of his faults. His aversion to sexual behavior may have left him free to spend his blood upon his work. His painful sensitivity opened up to him a thousand facets of reality unseen by the common eye. He would follow through a dozen streets or all day long some unusual face, and then in his studio draw it as well as if he had brought the model with him. His mind leaped at peculiarities, strange forms, actions, ideas. The Nile, he wrote, has discharged more water into the sea than is at present contained in all the waters of the earth. Consequently, all the sea and the rivers have passed through the mouth of the Nile an infinite number of times. By a kindred bent he indulged himself in queer pranks. So one day he hid the cleaned gut of a ram in a room, and when his friends had gathered there he inflated the gut by a bellows in an adjoining chamber until the swelling skin crowded his guests against the walls. He recorded in his notebooks a variety of second-class fables and jokes. His curiosity, his inversion, his sensitivity, his passion for perfection, all entered into his most fatal defect, the inability or unwillingness to complete what he had begun. Perhaps he entered upon each work of art with a view to solve a technical problem of composition, color, or design, and lost interest in the work when the solution had been found. Art, he said, lies in conceiving and designing, not in the actual execution. This was labor for lesser minds. Or he pictured to himself some subtlety, significance, or perfection that his patient and at last impatient hand could not realize, and he abandoned the effort in despair, as in the case of the face of Christ. He passed too quickly from one task or subject to another. He was interested in too many things. He lacked a unifying purpose, a dominating idea. This universal man was a medley of brilliant fragments. He was possessed of and by too many abilities to harness them to one goal. In the end, he mourned, I have wasted my hours. He wrote five thousand pages, but never completed one book. Quantitatively, he was more an author than an artist. He speaks of having composed 120 manuscripts. Fifty remain. They are written from right to left in a half-oriental script that almost lends color to the legend that at one time he traveled in the Near East, served the Egyptian sultan, and embraced the Mohammedan faith. His grammar is poor, his spelling is individualistic. His reading was varied and desultory. He had a little library of thirty-seven volumes, the Bible, Aesop, 
Diogenes Laertius, Ovid, Livy, Pliny the Elder, Dante, Petrarch, Poggio, Filelfo, Ficino, Pulci, The Travels of Mandeville, and Treatises on Mathematics, Cosmography, Anatomy, Medicine, Agriculture, Palmistry, and the Art of War. He remarked that the knowledge of past times and of geography adorns and nourishes the intellect, but his many anachronisms show only a scattering acquaintance with history. He aspired to be a good writer, made several attempts at eloquence, as in his repeated descriptions of a flood, and wrote vivid accounts of a tempest and a battle. He clearly intended to publish some of his writings, and often began to put his notes into order for this purpose. So far as we know, he published nothing during his lifetime, but he must have allowed some friends to see selected manuscripts, for there are references to his writings in Flavio Biondo, Jerome Cardin, and Cellini. He wrote equally well on science and art, and divided his time almost evenly between them. The most substantial of his manuscripts is the Trattato della Pittura, or Treatise on Painting, first published in 1651. Despite devoted modern editing, it is still a loose aggregation of fragments, in poor array, and often repetitious. Leonardo anticipates those who argue that painting can be learned only by painting. He thinks a sound knowledge of theory helps, and he laughs off his critics as being like those of whom Demetrius declared that he took no more account of the wind that came from their mouths than of that which they expelled from their lower parts. His basic precept is that the student of art should study nature rather than copy the works of other artists. See to it, O oh painter, that when you go into the fields you give your attention to the various objects, looking carefully in turn first at one object, then at another, making a bundle of different things selected among those of less value. Of course, the painter must study anatomy, perspective, modeling by light and shade. Boundaries, sharply defined, make a picture seem wooden. Always make the figure so that the bosom is not turned in the same direction as the head. Here is one secret of the grace in Leonardo's own compositions. Finally, he urges, make figures with such action as may suffice to show what the figure has in mind. Did he forget to do this with Mona Lisa, or did he exaggerate our ability to read the soul in the eyes and the lips? Leonardo the man appears more clearly and variously in his drawings than in his paintings or his notes. Their number is legion. One manuscript alone, the Codice Atlantico in Milan, has seventeen hundred. Many are hasty sketches, many are such masterpieces that we must rank Leonardo as the ablest, subtlest, profoundest draftsman of the Renaissance. There is nothing in the drawings of Michelangelo or Rembrandt that can match the amazing Virgin Christ and St. Anne in Burlington House. Leonardo used silver point, charcoal, red chalk, or pen and ink, to draw almost every phase of physical, many of spiritual life. A hundred putti or bambini spread their fat and dimpled legs in his sketches. A hundred youths, half Greek in profile, half woman in soul. A hundred pretty maidens of demure and tender mien, hair waving in the wind. Athletes proud of their muscles and warriors breathing battle or gleaming with armor and arms. Saints from the soft beauty of Sebastian to the haggard skin of Jerome. Gentle Madonnas seeing the world redeemed in their babes, complex drawings of costumes for masquerades, and studies of shawls and scarves and laces and robes caressing the head or the neck, curling on the arm, or falling from shoulder or knee in folds that catch the light, invite the touch, and seem more real than the garments on our flesh. All these forms sing the zest and marvel of life, but scattered among them are horrible grotesques and caricatures, deformed heads, leering imbeciles, bestial faces, crippled bodies, shrews contorted with fury, a medusa with snakes for hair, men desiccated and corrugated with age, women in the last stages of decay. This was another side of reality, and Leonardo's impartial universal eye caught it, fixed it, put it down resolutely on his sheets, as if to look ugly evil squarely in the face. He kept these horrors out of his paintings, which owed some loyalty to beauty, but he had to find room for them in his philosophy. Perhaps nature pleased him more than man did, for nature was neutral and could not be accused of evil as malice. Everything in her was forgivable to an unbiased eye. So Leonardo drew many landscapes and scolded Botticelli for ignoring them. He followed the tendrils of flowers faithfully with his pen. He hardly painted a picture without giving it added magic and depth by a background of trees, streams, rocks, mountains, clouds, and sea. 
He almost banished architectural forms from his art so that he might leave more room for nature to enter and absorb the painted individual or group into the reconciling totality of things. Sometimes Leonardo tried his hand at architectural design, but with chastening unsuccess. There are architectural fantasies among his drawings, quaint and half-Syrian. He liked domes and made a pretty sketch for a kind of Saint Sophia that Lodovico might build in Milan. It never rose from the ground. Lodovico sent him to Pavia to help redesign the cathedral there, but Leonardo found the mathematicians and anatomists of Pavia more interesting than the cathedral. He mourned the noise, filth, and narrow congestion of Italian towns, studied town planning, and submitted to Lodovico a sketch for a city of two levels. On the lower level would move all commercial traffic, and loads for the service and convenience of the common people. The upper level would be a roadway twenty braccia, some forty feet wide, upheld by colonnaded arcades, and not to be used by vehicles, but solely for the convenience of the gentlefolk. Spiral staircases would occasionally connect the two levels, and every here and there a fountain would cool and cleanse the air. Lodovico had no funds for such an upheaval, and the Milanese aristocracy remained on the earth. 6. The Inventor It is hard for us to realize that to Lodovico, as to Caesar Borgia, Leonardo was primarily an engineer. Even the pageants that he planned for the Duke of Milan included ingenious automata. Every day, says Vasari, he made models and designs for the removal of mountains with ease and to pierce them to pass from one place to another, and by means of levers, cranes, and winches to raise and draw heavy weights. He devised methods for cleaning harbors and for raising water from great depths. He developed a machine for cutting threads in screws, he worked along correct lines towards a water wheel. He devised frictionless roller-bearing band brakes. He designed the first machine gun and mortars with cog gears to elevate their range. A multiple belt drive, three-speed transmission gears, an adjustable monkey wrench, a machine for rolling metal, a movable bed for a printing press, a self-locking worm gear for raising a ladder. He had a plan for underwater navigation, but refused to explain it. He revived the idea of Hero of Alexandria for a steam engine, and showed how steam pressure in a gun could propel an iron bolt twelve hundred yards. He invented a device for winding and evenly distributing yarn on a revolving spindle, and scissors that would open and close with one movement of the hand. Often he let his fancy bemuse him, as when he suggested inflated skis for walking on water or a watermill that would simultaneously play several musical instruments. He described a parachute. If a man have a tent made of linen, of which the apertures have all been stopped up, and it be twelve cubits across and twelve in depth, he will be able to throw himself down from any great height without sustaining any injury. Through half his life he pondered the problem of human flight. Like Tolstoy, he envied the birds as a species in many ways superior to man. He studied in detail the operation of their wings and tails, the mechanics of their rising, gliding, turning, and descending. His sharp eye noted these movements with passionate curiosity, and his swift pencil drew and recorded them. He observed how birds avail themselves of air currents and pressures. He planned the conquest of the air. You will make an anatomy of the wings of a bird, together with the muscles of the breast which move these wings. And you will do the same for a man, in order to show the possibility of a man sustaining himself in the air by the beating of wings. The rising of birds without beating their wings is not produced by anything other than their circular movement amid the currents of the wind. Your bird should have no other model than the bat, because its membranes serve as a means of binding together the framework of the wings. A bird is an instrument working according to mechanical law. This instrument it is within the power of man to reproduce with all its movements, but not with a corresponding degree of strength. He made several drawings of a screw mechanism by which a man, through the action of his feet, might cause wings to beat fast enough to raise him into the air. In a brief essay, Sul Volo, on flight, he described a flying machine made by him with strong starched linen, leather joints, and thongs of raw silk. He called this the bird, and wrote detailed instructions for flying it. If this instrument made with a screw be turned swiftly, the said screw will make its spiral in the air, and it will rise high. 
make trial of the machine over the water, so that if you fall you do not do yourself any harm. The great bird will take its first flight, filling the whole world with amazement and all records with its fame, and it will bring eternal glory to the nest where it was born. Did he actually try to fly? A note in the Codice Atlantico says, Tomorrow morning, on the second day of January 1496, I will make the thong in the attempt. We do not know what this means. Fazio Cardano, father of Jerome Cardin the physicist, from 1501 to 1576, told his son that Leonardo himself had essayed flight. Some have thought that when Antonio, one of Leonardo's aides, broke his leg in 1510, it was in trying to fly one of Leonardo's machines. We do not know. Leonardo was on the wrong tack. Human flight came not by imitating the bird, except in gliding, but by applying the internal combustion engine to a propeller that could beat the air not downward, but backward. Forward speed made possible upward flight. But the noblest distinction of man is his passion for knowledge. Shocked by the wars and crimes of mankind, disheartened by the selfishness of ability and the perpetuity of poverty, Saddened by the superstitions and credulities with which the nations and generations gild the brevity and indignities of life, we feel our race in some part redeemed when we see that it can hold a soaring dream in its mind and heart for three thousand years, from the legend of Daedalus and Icarus, through the baffled groping of Leonardo and a thousand others, to the glorious and tragic victory of our time. 7. The Scientist Side by side with his drawings, sometimes on the same page, sometimes scrawled across a sketch of a man or a woman, a landscape or a machine, are the notes in which this insatiable mind puzzled over the laws and operations of nature. Perhaps the scientist grew out of the artist. Leonardo's painting compelled him to study anatomy, the laws of proportion and perspective, the composition and reflection of light, the chemistry of pigments and oils. From these researches he was drawn to a more intimate investigation of structure and function in plants and animals and from these inquiries he rose to a philosophical conception of universal and invariable natural law. Often the artist peered out again in the scientist. The scientific drawing might be itself a thing of beauty, or terminate in a graceful arabesque. Like most scientists of his time, Leonardo tended to identify scientific method with experience rather than experiment. Remember, he counsels himself, when discoursing about water to adduce first experience and then reason. Since any man's experience can be no more than a microscopic fragment of reality, Leonardo supplemented his with reading, which can be experienced by proxy. He studied carefully but critically the writings of Albert of Saxony, gained a partial acquaintance with the ideas of Roger Bacon, Albertus Magnus, and Nicholas of Cusa, and learned much from association with Luca Pacioli, Marcantonio della Torre, and other professors in the University of Pavia but he tested everything with his own experience. Whoever refers to authorities in disputing ideas works with his memory rather than his reason. He was the least occult of the thinkers of his age. He rejected alchemy and astrology and hoped for a time when all astrologers will be castrated. He tried his hand at almost every science. He took enthusiastically to mathematics as the purest form of reasoning. He felt a certain beauty in geometrical figures, and drew some on the same page with a study for the Last Supper. He expressed vigorously one of the fundamental principles of science. There is no certainty where one can neither apply any of the mathematical sciences, nor any of those that are based upon them. And he proudly echoed Plato. Let no man who is not a mathematician read the elements of my work. He was fascinated by astronomy. He proposed to make glasses in order to see the moon large, but apparently he did not make them. He writes, The sun does not move. The earth is not in the center of the circle of the sun, nor in the center of the universe. The moon has every month a winter and a summer. He discusses acutely the causes of spots on the moon, and combats on that matter the views of Albert of Saxony. Taking a lead from the same Albert, he argues that since every heavy substance presses downward and cannot be upheld perpetually, the whole earth must become spherical, and will ultimately be covered with water. He noticed on high elevations the fossil shells of marine animals, and concluded that the waters had once reached those altitudes. Boccaccio had suggested this about 1338 in his Filocopo. 
He rejected the notion of a universal flood and ascribed to the earth an antiquity that would have shocked the orthodoxy of his time. He assigned to the accumulations brought down by the Po a duration of 200,000 years. He made a map of Italy as he imagined it to have been in an early geological era. The Sahara Desert, he thought, had once been covered with salt water. Mountains have been formed through erosion by rain. The bottom of the sea is continually rising with the detritus of all the streams that flow into it. Very great rivers flow underground, and the movement of life-giving water in the body of the earth corresponds to the movement of the blood in the body of man. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed not by human wickedness, but by slow geological action, probably the subsidence of their soil into the Dead Sea. Leonardo followed avidly the advances made in physics by Jean Buridan and Albert of Saxony in the 14th century. He wrote a hundred pages on motion and weight, and hundreds more on heat, acoustics, optics, color, hydraulics, and magnetism. Mechanics is the paradise of the mathematical sciences, for by its means one comes to the fruit of mathematics in useful work. He delighted in pulleys, cranes, and levers, and saw no end to what they could lift or move but he laughed at seekers for perpetual motion. Force with material movement and weight with percussion are the four accidental powers in which all the works of mortals have their being and their end. Despite these lines, he was not a materialist. On the contrary, he defined force as a spiritual capacity, spiritual because the life in it is invisible and without body, impalpable because the body in which it is produced is increased neither in size nor in weight. He studied the transmission of sound and reduced its medium to waves of air. When the string of a lute is struck, it conveys a movement to a similar string of the same tone on another lute, as one may convince oneself by placing a straw on the string similar to the one struck. He had his own notion of a telephone. If you cause your ship to stop and place the head of a long tube in the water and place the other extremity to your ear, you will hear ships at a great distance from you. You can also do the same by placing the head of the tube upon the ground, and you will then hear anyone passing at a distance. But sight and light interested him more than sound. He marveled at the eye. Who would believe that so small a space could contain the images of all the universe? And he wondered even more at the power of the mind to recall an image long past. He gave an excellent description of the means by which spectacles compensate for the weakening of the muscles of the eyes. He explained the operation of the eye by the principle of the camera obscura. In the camera and in the eye, the image is inverted because of the pyramidal crossing of the light rays that come from the object into the camera or the eye. He analyzed the refraction of sunlight in the rainbow. Like Leon Battista Alberti, he had a good notion of complementary colors four centuries before the definitive work of Michel Chevreul. He planned, began, and left countless notes for a treatise on water. The movements of water captivated his eye and mind. He studied placid and turbulent streams, springs and falls, bubbles and foam, torrents and cloudbursts, and the simultaneous fury of wind and rain. Without water, he wrote, repeating Thales after 2100 years, nothing can exist among us. He anticipated Pascal's fundamental principle of hydrostatics, that the pressure exerted upon a fluid is transmitted by it. He noted that the liquids in communicating vessels keep the same level. Inheriting Milan's tradition of hydraulic engineering, he designed and built canals, suggested ways of conducting navigable canals under or over the rivers that cross them, and proposed to free Florence from her need of Pisa as a port by canalizing the Arno from Florence to the sea. Leonardo was not a utopian dreamer, but he planned his studies and works as if he had a dozen lives to live. Armed with the great text of Theophrastus on plants, he turned his alert mind to natural history. He examined the system on which leaves are arranged about their stalks and formulated its laws. He observed that the rings in a cross-section of a tree trunk record the years of its growth by their number and the moisture of the year by their width. He seems to have shared several delusions of his time as to the power of certain animals to heal some human diseases by their presence or their touch. He atoned for this uncharacteristic lapse into superstition by investigating the anatomy of the horse with a thoroughness to which recorded history had no precedent. He prepared a special treatise on the subject, but it was lost in the French occupation of Milan. He almost inaugurated modern comparative anatomy by studying the limbs of men and animals in juxtaposition. 
He set aside the superannuated authority of Galen and worked with actual bodies. The anatomy of man he described not only in words but in drawings that excelled anything yet done in that field. He planned a book on the subject and left for it hundreds of illustrations and notes. He claimed to have dissected more than thirty human cadavers, and his countless drawings of the fetus, the heart, lungs, skeleton, musculature, viscera, eye, skull, and brain, and the principal organs in woman, support his claim. He was the first to give, in remarkable drawings and notes, a scientific representation of the uterus, and he described accurately the three membranes enclosing the fetus. He was the first to delineate the cavity of the bone that supports the cheek, now known as the antrum of Hymor. He poured wax into the valves of the heart of a dead bull to get an exact impression of the chambers. He was the first to characterize the moderator band, or catena, of the right ventricle. He was fascinated by the network of blood vessels. He divined the circulation of the blood, but did not quite grasp its mechanism. The heart, he wrote, is much stronger than the other muscles. The blood that returns when the heart opens is not the same as that which closes the valves. He traced the blood vessels, nerves, and muscles of the body with fair accuracy. He attributed old age to arteriosclerosis, and this to lack of exercise. He began a volume, De Figura Humana, on the proper proportions of the human figure as an aid to artists, and some of his ideas were incorporated in his friend Pacioli's treatise, De Divina Proportione. He analyzed the physical life of man from birth to decay, and then planned a survey of mental life. Oh, that it may please God to let me also expound the psychology of the habits of man in such fashion as I am describing his body. Was Leonardo a great scientist? Alexander von Humboldt considered him the greatest physicist of the fifteenth century, and William Hunter ranked him as the greatest anatomist of his epoch. He was not as original as Humboldt supposed. Many of his ideas in physics had come down to him from Jean Buridan, Albert of Saxony, and other predecessors. He was capable of egregious errors, as when he wrote that no surface of water that borders upon the air will ever be lower than that of the sea. But such slips are remarkably few in so vast a production of notes on almost everything on the earth or in the sky. His theoretical mechanics were those of a highly intelligent amateur. He lacked training, instruments, and time. That he achieved so much in science, despite these handicaps and his labors in art, is among the miracles of a miraculous age. From his studies in so many fields, Leonardo rose at times to philosophy. O oh, marvelous necessity! Thou with supreme reason constrainest all effects to be the direct result of their causes, and by a supreme and irrevocable law every natural action obeys thee by the shortest possible process. This has all the proud ring of nineteenth-century science, and suggests that Leonardo had shed some theology. Vasari, in the first edition of his Life of the Artist, wrote that he was of so heretical a cast of mind that he conformed to no religion whatever, accounting it perchance better to be a philosopher than a Christian. But Vasari omitted this passage in later editions. Like many Christians of the time, Leonardo took a fling now and then at the clergy. He called them Pharisees, accused them of deceiving the simple with bogus miracles, and smiled at the false coin of celestial promissory notes which they exchanged for the coinage of this world. On one good Friday, he wrote, Today all the world is in mourning because one man died in the Orient. He seems to have thought that dead saints were incapable of hearing the prayers addressed to them. I could wish that I had such power of language as should avail me to censure those who would extol the worship of men above that of the sun. Those who have wished to worship men as gods have made a very grave error. He took more liberties with Christian iconography than any other Renaissance artist. He suppressed halos, put the virgin across her mother's knee, and made the infant Jesus try to bestride the symbolic lamb. He saw mind in matter and believed in a spiritual soul, but apparently thought that the soul could act only through matter, and only in harmony with invariable laws. He wrote that the soul can never be corrupted with the corruption of the body, but he added that death destroys memory as well as life, and without the body the soul can neither act nor feel. He addressed the deity with humility and fervor in some passages, but at other times he identified God with nature, natural law, and necessity. A mystic pantheism was his religion until his final years. 8. In France, 1516-1519 to 
Arrived in France, Leonardo, 64 and ill, was established with his faithful companion Francesco Melzi, 24, in a pretty house at Clou, between the town and chateau of Amboise on the Loire, then the frequent residence of the king. His contract with Francis I designated him as painter, engineer, and architect of the king and state mechanician, at an annual salary of 700 crowns, or $8,750. Francis was generous and appreciated genius even in its decline. He enjoyed conversation with Leonardo and affirmed, reported Cellini, that never had any man come into the world who knew so much as Leonardo, and that not only in sculpture, painting, and architecture, for in addition he was a great philosopher. Leonardo's anatomical drawings amazed the physicians at the French court. For a time he labored manfully to earn his salary. He arranged masks and pageants for royal displays, worked on plans to bind the Loire and the Saone with canals and to drain the marshes of Salonia, and may have shared in designing parts of the Loire Chateau. Some evidence links his name with the jewel loveliness of Chambord. Probably he did little painting after 1517, for in that year he suffered a paralytic stroke that immobilized his right side. He painted with his left hand, but needed both hands for careful work. He was now a wrinkled wreck of the youth whose repute for beauty of body and face came down to Vasari across half a century. His once proud self-confidence faded, his serenity of spirit yielded to the pains of decay, his love of life gave place to religious hope. He made a simple will, but he asked for all the services of the church at his funeral. Once he had written, As a day well spent makes it sweet to sleep, so a life well used makes it sweet to die. Vasari tells a touching story of how Leonardo died on May 2, 1519, in the arms of the king, but apparently Francis was elsewhere at the time. The body was buried in the cloister of the collegiate church of Saint Florentin in Amboise. Melzi wrote to Leonardo's brothers, informing them of the event, and added, It would be impossible for me to express the anguish that I have suffered from this death, and while my body holds together I shall live in perpetual unhappiness, and for good reason. The loss of such a man is mourned by all, for it is not in the power of nature to create another. May Almighty God rest his soul forever. How shall we rank him, although which of us commands the variety of knowledge and skills required to judge so multiple a man? The fascination of his polymorphous mind lures us into exaggerating his actual achievement, for he was more fertile in conception than in execution. He was not the great scientist or engineer or painter or sculptor or thinker of his time. He was merely the man who was all of these together and in each field rivaled the best. There must have been men in the medical schools who knew more of anatomy than he. The most notable works of engineering in the territory of Milan had been accomplished before Leonardo came. Both Raphael and Titian then left a more impressive total of fine paintings than has survived from Leonardo's brush. Michelangelo was a greater sculptor. Machiavelli and Guicciardini were profounder minds. And yet, Leonardo's studies of the horse were probably the best work done in the anatomy of that age. Lodovico and Caesar Borgia chose him from all Italy as their engineer. Nothing in the paintings of Raphael or Titian or Michelangelo equals the Last Supper. No painter has matched Leonardo in subtlety of nuance or in the delicate portrayal of feeling and thought and pensive tenderness. No statue of the time was so highly rated as Leonardo's plaster Sforza. No drawing has ever surpassed the virgin child in St. Anne, and nothing in Renaissance philosophy soared above Leonardo's conception of natural law. He was not the man of the Renaissance, for he was too gentle, introverted, and refined to typify an age so violent and powerful in action and speech. He was not quite the universal man, since the qualities of statesman or administrator found no place in his variety. But with all his limitations and incompletions, he was the fullest man of the Renaissance, perhaps of all time. Contemplating his achievement, we marvel at the distance that man has come from his origins and renew our faith in the possibilities of mankind.